This lecture may be injurious to your sentiments. It may incur rational sense in you. Watch at your own discretion. Your sentiments are not my liability. How does a man feel once uprooted from his own home and homeland? How is the physical journey of a refugee? What about the mental impact of that physical journey? What was the condition of refugees in Kolkata after the so-called independence of 1947? Can there be any rehabilitation once one loses his identity along with his home? All these questions are at the core of the poem Rehabilitation by Shankho Ghosh. Dear students, the objective of this lecture is not to summarize the text, but to analyze it as a literary piece. Discussing the background, style, structure, imagery, symbolism, and of course the central ideas. I hope you will have a comprehensive understanding of the poem by the end of this lecture. And if at any point you feel you need more clarity, ask for it commenting your question with a timestamp, and I shall try my best to make it clear to you. The poem Rehabilitation portrays the immediate aftermath of partition from the point of view of a refugee. The original title in Bangla is Punur Bashan, of which the title Rehabilitation is a literal translation. Due to the partition of India based on religious obstinacy, millions and millions of people had to suffer physically, mentally, financially and in other ways. People were uprooted from their homelands, places of their birth, their work, their love, their language and their culture. They had to leave behind everything that was part of their identity except one, their religious identity. Religious identity determined who they were, an Indian or a Pakistani, and no other identity was cared for in that flood of utter madness. That caused an identity crisis along with the trauma caused by the religious divide that catastrophically culminated in mass murders, loots, riots and rapes. Humanity lost in front of the massive force of religion and politics combined. It was the greatest and bloodiest migration in the known history of mankind. It left a permanent impact on the lives of crores of people who lost their homes, their identity, their relatives, their honor, their material properties as well as their faith in humanity and gained a trauma to last a lifetime. In the context of such a man-made massacre causing mass migration, Shankho Ghosh portrays the shattered and scattered thoughts of a refugee. Shankho Ghosh was born in 1932 in Chadpur, Kumilla, while his ancestral home was in Borishal and he spent most of his childhood in Pabna, all the districts belonging to East Bengal. As a result of partition, he had to migrate to Kolkata, West Bengal, where he studied and got his master's degree in Bangla literature from the University of Calcutta. I am not to regurgitate here information about the poet that can be found on Wikipedia. But, as you can see, he was a 15-year-old boy when partition happened. And so, it left a permanent impression on his young mind, turning him into a refugee forever. Why do I say he was a refugee forever? To understand that, we have to understand the poem. Structurally, the poem has three sections. The first section is where the poet speaker speaks of the past, the journey from his homeland to his place of refuge, from East Bengal to West Bengal. The second section describes the present, the concrete image of the place of refuge, that is Kolkata. The third section is very complex as the poet mixes concrete images with abstract ideas, physical experiences with mental trauma and the fathomlessly frustrating present with the unassailably lost past. This section asserts the void at the core of the refugee's existence. The poem is mostly constituted of scattered images and shattered expressions. 
The emotion of the speaker is not conveyed through complete and structured sentences. Instead, as we read on, the images coming in sequence tell us a lot that is untold otherwise. It reminds the Iliotesque idea of objective correlative, which means, in Iliot's own words, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events, which shall be the formula of that particular emotion, such that when the external facts which must terminate in sensory experience are given, the emotion is immediately evoked. The poem's first section depicts whatever the poet had around him. He mentions grass and pebbles, reptiles, broken temples. Grass and pebbles symbolize the simple, rustic, rural homeland where the speaker was born and brought up. Reptiles have a symbolic significance. Reptiles cannot stand upright as a vertebrate. Man lost his backbone, metaphorically, and became like a reptile crawling on the land. He could not stand upright to face the catastrophe that was concocted by men of power and executed by their fervent followers. It's not only the temples that were broken. Temples, mosques, and monuments of different kinds carry the sign of a culture. It's not about the faith or worship, but about the loss of the heritage of a land. A piece of history is destroyed. The regional stories and folk tales refer to regional places, trees, buildings, or monuments. By destroying those, one cannot do anything to a faith but to own roots, history, and heritage. Faith can survive without a building. Faith can be shaken off with a rational, observant, and honest mind even when there are too many places of worship all around. Men hurt each other by destroying whatever they have an emotional relationship with. Ultimately, all they love is lost in the competition of hurting each other. So comes the exile as if it is an exodus from a paradise to a new world of pain and suffering. Even the folklores are left behind because folklores are regional. You cannot get the essence of folklore if you are disconnected from the region it relates to. Darkness comes with the solitary sunset as the refugee speaker solitarily looks towards an unforeseen and gloomy future. Everything has lost meaning as this utter madness among the masses has come down as destructive as landslides. Metaphor again. Arrows and spears are not literally just arrows and spears, but all kinds of arms, instruments and methods of violence that terrified people enough to leave their homestead behind. A homestead is not just a home where a person lives. The word homestead carries a deeper connotation than that. A homestead is where a person's family has lived longer than his lifetime. A homestead is where a person was born. A homestead is where all his little but precious memories are entangled. However tiny a hut it is, the significance of homestead is that it is an essential part of a person's identity. That identity is left behind as all shiver with their faces turned west. The refugee speaker was to move from the eastern part of Bengal to the western part. Millions of refugees were moving towards a new place trying to save themselves from those arrows and spears of communal hatred. They were carrying the burden of their memories, but leaving everything that constituted those memories. People were moving in a line, moving like a serpent. They took shelter under trees as they had become homeless, and all the properties they were carrying were some broken boxes, 
symbolizing how petty, insignificant things those were, as well as how valuable they were in the hands of those who had lost everything else in their possession. Whatever was gone was gone. Whatever is left, though are just some broken boxes, are the things they clung on to. Psychologically speaking, those were symbolically representing their hope to settle down at some place one day and build up a new home. Their journey was a journey of mental exhaustion, a journey of agony, one step denying another. While the emotions entangled with their homes were trying to restrain them from leaving everything behind, the need for a safer place makes them take one step forward, however heavy it feels. This is a journey that nobody wants to take, but the situation compels them to. They had homes until now, but suddenly they are homeless. What an incredible independence it was. It set people free from their homes and brought them under the sky with the baggage of religion on their backs and a bonfire of communal violence in their front. Now the refugee speaker delineates before us the picture at present when he has reached Kolkata. Shialda station is the gateway to Kolkata, especially if you are coming from the east. Naturally, in that time of refugee crisis, Shialda station became a shelter for the deluge of people coming from the east. At some point, 10 or 12,000 people were living daily in that railway station. Every day, thousands of refugees were coming to Kolkata, the city of joy, to find a place to stay, to find work of any kind, to find hope for living at the very least. The situation was dire. As the poet speaker reaches Shialda, he feels the high noon and sees the pockmarked walls. Whereas high noon goes with the dire situation, the pockmarked walls show the anger stemming from frustration among the crowd. The refugees had suffered humiliation and violence. They left their homes, seeking to restart their lives in a new and safe place. They came to Kolkata, the biggest city, hoping to find a chance to rebuild their lives. And what do they see as soon as they arrive at Shialda? A flood of thousands of refugees without shelter, without food, without even law and order. The government's incompetence could not be more conspicuous. Remember what you have already learned about the condition of the refugees from Pratibha Bushu's The Marooned and Manik Bandopadhyay's The Final Solution. The speaker mentions blind alleys where people tried to find shelters, forming refugee colonies by occupying any empty place overnight. The environment was filled with slogans against the situation and the good-for-nothing government. They used to gather near the monument and made demonstrations so that the government might be attentive to their relief. The discrimination among the Bangalis began to reach its peak. People who had already been residents in the western parts of Bengal, especially in the Delta area, started to hurl the term Bangal to indicate the refugees of East Bengal who were not thought of as sophisticated as the well-settled, educated and cultured citizens of West Bengal, especially Kolkata. This derogatory term was used to insult the homeless refugees who were thought of as outsiders coming to snatch a share in the wealth and land of West Bengal. Refugees, even though they were Bangalis, were insulted by the other Bangalis because of their accents, their colloquialisms, their food choices. That's how our culture, despite being one culture, the Bangali culture, began to break. How brilliant we Bangalis are! We cut the very branch of culture into two on which our damn identity sits. 
and now our intellectual existence has become so ridiculously hollow that it is incredulous to believe it was this land that made the British Empire take back the decision to divide Bengal in 1911. What a wonderful achievement it is that the land of the Renaissance is now the land of clowns and claws. The refugee speaker finds himself on a bed of arrows. It is an allusion to the Mahabharata where the mythological character Bhishyo lay on the bed of arrows. It was a neither living nor dying situation. The life of a refugee is compared to that image. Their existence has come on the footpath just like lamp posts. The existence of a lamp post is very obvious, yet the elite is quite oblivious of it. The river Ganga which is to this land what the Nile is to Egypt, has turned red because of so much bloodshed. There is a darkness of hopelessness in the core of its being, just as there is malnutrition in the bodies of refugees trying to survive anyhow on the banks of the river. Surrounded by all these macabre images, the speaker can yet hear the sound of the river flowing at its own pace, just as time flows endlessly without caring about what is happening around. The great achievement of human skill and knowledge, the Haura Bridge, stands tall, as opposed to the condition of the people who have nothing but to observe the futile flow of time just like the river, living with a void existence. At this particular point I remember a song sung by Bhupen Hajarika. Bistir no dupare rasong khumanusir hahakar shune unishabde nirabe o ganga tumi ganga bui chokeno. I strongly suggest you to listen to this song if you can. I shall put the link in the description. Hello, this is Rishikesh and you are welcome to my channel Rishikesh Lectures. Education is quintessential for any civilization to sustain its civil sense. Observing the calamitous condition of the education system and realizing the urgency to spread education as far as one can, I have started to lecture on YouTube. As far as authenticity is concerned, I have a first class master's degree in English literature and I am UGC net qualified. My lectures are long and detailed as a real classroom lecture should be. Also, most of my lectures are available on YouTube Music as podcasts. And if you like the way I try to educate, consider liking, sharing and subscribing to the channel so that the algorithm gets it to more and more students of literature. Now we are moving on to the last section of the poem. This begins with an unusual expression. Whatever is fountain around me. Here, fountain denotes abundance profusion. Three metaphoric images are given, flying hair, naked path and the stormy torch. These are different images portraying different parts and conditions of the city. Women, as you perhaps remember from the final solution and the marooned, were compelled to turn into prostitutes because of the extreme poverty and hunger aided by administrative imbecility and opportunistic exploitation. The flying hair points to the condition of women turning to prostitution. The naked path is where violence has taken place and naked bodies are lying around. The stormy torch is where people are agitating as a result of their sufferings. The poet speaker sees the coming of the dawn, the people taking bath in the river Ganga. But what is clear to him is the sheep of the cremation ground. Traditionally, dawn is to be taken as a metaphor signifying new hope. According to Hindu belief, Ganga is a holy river and it can cleanse one's body and soul if one bathes in it. But to the poet, the city is in such a condition that neither the dawn can bring a new hope nor bathing in the Ganga can cleanse one out of the poison that has spread. 
The riots, rapes and refugee conditions have altogether made the city of joy a cremation ground. And yet city life goes on in its course as if nothing matters. Just as Shiv, a particular god in Hinduism, keeps lying down on cremation grounds, smeared with ashes, careless of the surroundings. Just as the surroundings of the cremation ground cannot influence Shiv, the macabre condition of the city cannot influence the core of city life. It is a sarcastic remark. The elite, the powerful and the rich were busy in their own ways, living and doing as they were used to. The refugees existed all around the city. Their conditions, their agitations and their struggles were all visible to the bourgeoisie. And yet, from the bourgeois businesses to the entertainment sector, the heart of the city was unmoved by the conditions of the refugee people. The poet speaks of whatever has died to him meaning whatever has no more meaning for him. The count of the days has no meaning for him as life is going nowhere. A single day, like a birthday, has no meaning for him as life has got nothing to celebrate about it. All such little habits of life have become memory now. The refugee is now a beggar who sits in the fading dusk and tries to ignite the daily rehabilitation. This is a vision comprising a series of images. First of all, the bigger image is portraying the refugee's condition. The image of fading dusk has a metaphorical meaning too. It denotes the unclear, gloomy future. The memory of the past, what was, and the condition of the present, what remains, are compared to two flint stones that scrape each other. The two are so contradictory in their characteristics that they cannot go along in one's mind. A refugee trying to connect his past with his present cannot understand his own identity. Who is he? What he was or what he is? If what he was is fact, then how could he be where he is? And if what he is is real, then how could he relate it to where he was? This confusion makes him mad and yet he has to live because that is the basic instinct of life, to survive, though he cannot understand why. The state of mind is what is portrayed by the image of two flint stones that scrape each other. Flint stones ignite sparks and from a spark one gets light. But here what is ignited is the idea of daily rehabilitation, the idea of building a home again, the idea of living at home again, the idea of forming a root of identity again. Have you watched Ritti Ghatok's film Shuborno Rekha? I strongly recommend you to please, please, please watch it. It is available on YouTube and I shall give you the link in the description. The poem is a landslide of imagery and metaphor. The word whatever is used repetitively to show that everything has lost its meaning and significance and so they are referred to with whatever. The ideas are not structured into sentences, as a refugee's life is exactly the opposite of whatever is structured. The images are scattered and broken as they show the shattered mind of the speaker. The journey to find rehabilitation never ends, just as you shall find in Shubornorekha. Once you are uprooted from your homeland, once you have lost your identity, you struggle for your entire life to fill the void, but you cannot. Shankho Ghosh himself said in a documentary, I have lived in Kolkata for over 50 years, but the memory of an earlier life haunts this physical presence. 
And that is perhaps why my writings will always carry a sense of not having a country. I feel like an eternal refugee. Dear students, that's it for today. Please like, share and subscribe. Thank you.